When we're looking at changing breathing patterns, it's also very important not just to concentrate on the biomechanics. Um, too often, people are talking about taking fuller and deeper breaths. Abdominal movement and lateral expansion as the diaphragm is moving down. That's all very well. That's targeting the biomechanics of breathing. But what about another aspect, which would be the biochemistry of breathing? And the two will often go hand in hand. But I think it's very common. The emphasis is primarily on biomechanics. And the biochemistry is completely ignored. And in actual fact, the biochemistry can be sacrificed to help improve the biomechanics. We cannot sacrifice biochemistry or breathing to improve biomechanics. And this is why. The amount of air that we take into our lungs um, will determine the amount of carbon dioxide in the lungs. And it's the amount of carbon dioxide in the lungs that determines the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So the pressure of CO2 in the lungs is about 40 millimeters of mercury pressure during normal circumstances, during rest, not far off during physical exercise. And whatever the pressure of CO2 is in the lungs, it's also the same pressure in a healthy individual in the blood. But what does carbon dioxide do? Well, it's the primary stimulus to breathe. We take in a breath. That's not driven by oxygen need. You know, the brain isn't sending the message to breathe based on observation or monitoring of oxygen in the blood. Instead, the central chemoreceptors are the respiratory center of the brain. That's sending the message to breathe. That's the primary stimulus to breathe based on the changes of the gas CO2 in the blood. So one of the functions of carbon dioxide is it's the primary stimulus to breathe. If we develop poor breathing patterns that the biochemical dimension of breathing is under power, what does that mean? Well, it could be two different aspects to it. One is we're concerned with the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. What is the pressure of CO2 in the blood? Is it normal? Or is, it, is the individual just breathing that bit too hard? that the respiratory rate might be too fast, the amount of air that they're taking with each breath is a bit bigger, and that as a result, the amount of air that they're bringing into their lungs every minute is in excess of what it should be. In other words, simply over breathing. They are breathing too much air for what they need. And what happens if you breathe too much air? What happens is that you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the lungs, and as a result, you get too, rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood. And carbon dioxide, it performs a number of very, very important functions. One is smooth muscle, which is embedded in the blood vessels. When there's an increase of carbon dioxide, the blood vessels open up. When there's a decrease of carbon dioxide, blood vessels constrict. So many people come in to me and they've got cold hands. They've got cold hands and they've got cold feet. Cold hands, not the sign of a warm heart. Their peripheral blood vessels are constricted and very often that's synonymous with poor breathing patterns. When we start getting people, asking them, slowing down their breathing, and slowing down the breathing to the point of a slight air hunger, carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood and their blood circulation improves. They start to feel increased temperature internally. They start to feel that their hands are getting warmer. So our blood circulation is impacted by the chemistry of the, our breathing. Another aspect in terms of looking at biochemistry is the sensitivity of the body to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Now in my book, The Oxygen Advantage, I often wrote it as the ventilatory response to CO2. And all that basically means is, how sensitive is your breathing to an increase of CO2? If carbon dioxide increases in the blood, do you have an exaggerated breathing response to the increase of CO2? Now what would it mean, basically, Carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. And if you're very sensitive to the increase of CO2, generally it will mean that your breathing is going to be harder and faster. That your breathing during physical exercise, dyspnea, is going to be increased. That your breathing during rest is going to be increased. And I think this will have huge ramifications with people who are doing physical exercise. Because if you've got a strong ventilatory response to carbon dioxide, if you have a strong sensitivity to the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the blood. It means that your breathing is going to be hard and heavy. So you're experiencing increased breathlessness during physical exercise. But the individual during rest, 
We'll say that person who is prone to a little anxiety or panic disorder. That individual very often when I look at them, I see fast and upper chest breathing. It's really so, so common. You know, very seldom will I see slow diaphragmatic breathing in a person who's presenting to me with anxiety. And we know from the literature that up to 80% of people with anxiety and panic disorder are prone to breathing pattern disorders. So for that individual, their breathing is fast, their breathing is hard, they've got a low breath hold time, low bolt score, which the bolt score, it doesn't tell you the amount of CO2 in the blood, but the bolt score tells you the sensitivity of your body to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. A very interesting score, because from that we can deduce breathlessness during physical exercise, how the person is breathing during rest, and also an individual with anxiety or high stress or panic disorder. We know that when they present with a low bolt score, they have dysfunctional breathing, and their dysfunctional breathing is feeding back into their anxiety, feeding back into their panic disorder. Because often these people, they have an aversion of suffocation. They have an aversion of air hunger. And it's carbon dioxide that's increasing the air hunger. So my role is to teach functional breathing training. Biomechanics, absolutely, but not just biomechanics. As I said in the opening to this, don't train the biomechanics and sacrifice biochemistry in the process. And what do I mean by that? I mean when an instructor has such an emphasis on just diaphragmatic breathing and lateral expansion and contraction, and in the process that the amount of air that the individual breathes is increasing. When the amount of air that you are breathing is in excess of what you need, now the biochemistry is being impacted. So we need a balance. We need lateral expansion. We need lateral contraction of the lower two ribs. We need diaphragmatic movement, but we also need biochemistry. So the rule of thumb is that our breathing should be slow, not so many breaths per minute, light, not breathing disproportionately. In other words, breathing soft and breathing light and breathing quiet, even to the point of air hunger. And then you know that you're improving and helping to improve the biochemistry and the third aspect of it is to breathe deep. So it's slow, light and deep.